Hi, Galen here from Sunset Spark. Thank you for joining us. Today, Yadir and I are going to share with you our lesson and activities around sensors called Making Sense of Sensors. Let's take a look. So this is a lesson and three activities that looks at senses in humans, senses in animals, and then brings that into the world of sensors um, created by engineers and scientists and technologists. Um, most of the time when we think of senses, we think of the five core senses um, in humans. Um, we have taste, we have touch, we have sight or vision, um, we have olfactory or smell or scent, um, and we have hearing. Um, and this is something that students pretty much understand. It's something we all experience for the most part. Um, and uh, so they have a pretty good grasp on this. When we talk to students as young as kindergartners, they, they can usually name off three of the senses um, before they start thinking about it a bit more. But eventually everyone gets to it in the class. Um, if you're gonna go over this with students, it might be helpful to activate those senses by playing, um, for example, in hearing. You might wanna play like a musical instrument off camera or hiding in the classroom and have the students guess what it might be. Or if you wanna add a bit more pistache to it, you could try using um, Foley sound effects where they use different sounds to represent different actions. Um, as an example, like a lot of times in, in movies, you might hear an engine start up in a car like vroom, vroom, and they actually use the sound of an engine, but they add in there the sound of a lion roaring um, to give it a bit more oomph. So you could try looking up Foley effects as well to kind of have kids think a bit more and focus on their hearing to see if they can hear those subtle things that Foley artists are really doing to uh, manipulate our senses into thinking we're seeing something that we're not. Um, activating sight, um, that's a fun one to do. Um, you could do this in person or on online um, because you can just use uh, optical illusions, which optical illusions are sort of like reverse engineered images based off of how our vision works. So our vision system has uh, different processes in it that look at color, lightness, darkness, edges, contrast, um, and people can design photos or pictures, images based off of this to kind of make it mess with the way our system works. Like this one should look like it's moving around even though it's just a static image on the screen. And so this is another example of uh, our senses being manipulated, um, which is pretty fun for kids to, kids like talking, looking and talking about optical illusions. There's, there's a bunch out there. Some of them can be pretty creepy. Um, activating smell, um, you can use scratch and sniff stickers um, or just have kids describe. If you're doing this online, it might be best to just have kids describe something that smells a certain way, like something really stinky. That's a great activity to get kids to share vocabulary words and to really think about how they're perceiving something. Um, that works for touch as well. Um, we can't touch through the computer. Oops. We can't touch through the computer, so um, kids might want to describe something that they're touching in front of them. Maybe they're squishing a ball and they're just describing like it's squishy or it's soft. Maybe they're holding a stuffy. Maybe they're playing with a marker and they can describe what they're feeling and then have the kids guess and hold it up and go, I was holding a, I was describing a pencil. Um, and that might be a fun way to talk about and reintroduce touch to students. Um, taste uh, is another one that's difficult to do online. In a classroom, you could obviously pass out um, berries or a candy, uh, like a starburst or a jelly bean or something to have them describe taste and really have them just focus on what they're tasting. Um, online, it might be a bit more difficult, but you could do a quick experiment. Here's a fun experiment with our taste. Um, it involves taste and scent. When you taste something, our smells, smells actually help activate the taste. So if when students taste something for the first time um, of that day, like if they're gonna eat, the first time they eat, let's say a jelly bean, they pinch their nose and they put that jelly bean in their mouth and they chew on it. And then when they release their nose, they'll get extra flavor. It'll be like a, it really heightens the, heightens the tasting experience and kind of like 
blast them um, with new, new um, taste and smell sensations. Um, the reason why uh, smell is involved there is because smell and taste are, are mapped together uh, in the brain a little bit and in the, in the body. Um, the receptors are near each other. There's actually sense receptors in our tongue, um, which help activate that, that taste a little bit. And so when you pinch your nose, you're kind of cutting off some of the senses that work together in unison to, to make a taste. When we think of senses, what we're really talking about are receptors. Um, receptors are the parts of, uh, of our senses that do the receiving or the input of that sense, uh, in most cases. Not in every case, but in most cases. For example, in the, the tongue, we have taste buds, which have receptors in there for different tastes. Um, like bitter, sweet, sour, spicy, um, and so there's different receptors in there for those different those different like flavors, let's call them. Um, but what they're really picking up are the chemicals in those flavors, um, which are activating the receptors and getting transmitted to our brain. This is the same for smells as well. Um, in our olfactory system, we're picking up um, chemicals in the air that have that are are the smells. Um, for our vision system, we're using photoreceptors, which are picking up um, light and color. Um, for our sound system, we're picking up, uh, for our hearing, sorry, we're picking up um, sound waves. Um, but most of the work is done through receptors that are, that are like the inputs for that. Um, and scientists will study these receptors, both in humans and in and animals, um, to figure out how they work um, in hopes to like learn new things about biology um, they can be used for medicine, but also for technology. Um, humans have other senses too. We have a sense of balance, like we can tell if we're going to fall over, if we're about to fall over. Um, some people have better sense of balance than others, um, and that's definitely something that can be trained. Um, a lot of our senses can be trained. Our, our um, tasting and smell can be trained as well, like in a sense of like a, a wine sommelier. Uh, like they have practiced tasting and smelling, um, similar to we can practice our balance and get better at balance. Um, we also have a sense of temperature, whether something is hot or cold. Um, you, can, you can't tell the exact temperature when you touch something, but you can tell whether it's you know, hot, cold, very hot, very cold. Um, and so we have a sense of temperature. We also have a sense of our body parts, both how those body parts are moving, like if our arms are up or out or um, around, like we know the position our body's in even when our eyes are closed. And we can also tell where our body parts are. Like I know where my top of my head is, where my ears are. Um, and we know these are our senses because uh, things can happen to the body, to the brain, where we might lose these senses. Um, and so through injury or other medical problems or illness, we've seen that, that these senses can be deactivated in people where they don't they no longer know where their body parts are when their eyes are closed. Or in a sense of someone losing a limb, they still feel like that limb might be there. Um, so these are senses that are outside of the, the core senses. And maybe they're, they can be related to them in some way. Like we could think of the five core senses as overall types of senses. And temperature might be under um, sense of touch, um, et cetera. We also have sense of, of pain. like we we can feel if something hurts or not. Um, there are some people who, for one reason or another, don't have a sense of pain, um, which sounds great, but it actually can be pretty troubling uh, for people who have absolutely no sense of pain because they don't know when something might be hurting them, when they might be, might be seriously injured. Um, but that's something that, that can happen to people, um, that losing the sense of pain. Um, we also have a sense of hunger. We know when we're hungry, we feel hungry, and that's also wrapped up into our sensory system. When thinking about um, when thinking about animal senses, uh, I like to talk about Wild Kratts with kids. Um, it's a show that some PBS kids, so lots of kids have seen it. There's, I don't know, at least a hundred episodes, um, and they all they talk about are creature powers, uh, which. Sometimes there are senses that an animals have. Sometimes they talk more about like other things animals can do, which might fall not under senses, which are more like inputs, but more like outputs, like 
an animal that can jump really tall, really far, or climb really well, or stick to walls. Those are more of outputs. Um, whereas we're focused on inputs today, which are like being able to see really good, or smell really good, or feel electricity, or feel gravity or, or direction, like they know where to go on Earth um, using the magnetic field. These are all creature powers that animals have that, that humans don't have. Um, as an example, how does a snake smell? That's right, a snake smells um, odors with their tongue. So they stick their tongue out and they pull in chemicals from the air, uh, which translate into odors. Um, they also have uh, the ability, so when they pull those chemicals in, they also push them against the roof of their mouth with their tongue, which also has additional receptors on it. So there's receptors on their tongue and the roof of their mouth for um, picking up chemicals, which relate to uh, odor in the air. How does an ant smell? Ants sense odor with their antenna. Ants actually communicate with odors, with uh, pheromones, um, as they're more technically called. So they can pick up pheromones, so they can also place pheromones. That's sort of how they communicate. Um, so they have a pretty good sense of smell using their antenna by picking up the chemicals from those pheromones or from food or from anything else in the air. Sense off. Who smelled it best? Snake versus ant. What do you think? Ants smell better. They have 380 distinct odoring genes, um, which doesn't mean they can smell 300 distinct odors. It's, it's more technical than that, but based on the number of odoring genes they have, ants smell significantly better than um, snakes. So how does a butterfly taste? What does it use to taste? That's right, butterflies can taste with their feet. So when they land on something, they pick up the chemicals off of it and they can tell whether that's food that they would want to, want to uh, eat or not. Um, an octopus can sense light with their skin. This is another like super sense that we don't really have a relation for. Um, so octopuses, uh, their camouflage ability, which changes the, both the color and the texture of their skin, they, uh, they don't do that with their eyes. They're not looking at what something looks like with their eyes to determine how to mimic it. Their skin actually has receptors in it to pick the light off of, off of, the, um, off of the thing that they're on, and it uses that to pick up the pattern. Not its eyes, but its skin. Sense off, who sees it best? Mantis shrimp, which aren't shrimp we'd eat, but that's the only emoji I had, or butterflies. Who sees best? Who sees more color? Who sees more light? Butterflies see better. Butterflies have 16 or more types of photoreceptors, um, whereas mantis shrimp have like 12 to 15. Butterflies actually see lots of colors. They can see ultraviolets, they can see um, infrared light. Like they see a wide, wide, wide range of light. Um, so when butterflies are flying around, they are looking for um, flowers and flowers probably pop extra with their um, color sensitive vision of butterflies. The platypus can sense electricity, electric fields with its bill. So platypuses can use the electric field um, or sense electric fields with their bill, and they do that to find fish in the water. Fish give off an electrical um, give off an electrical charge uh, in the water, and the platypus can use that to find them and eat them. Um, bees. Here's another fun one. Bees can sense magnetic fields. Um, Scientists believe they do that uh, through, the, through an iron type substance in their thorax that is um, sensitive to magneti magnetism. Um, so they can feel the magnetic field of Earth and they use that to um, use that in navigation. Sense off. Who zapped it best? Dolphin versus platypus. Who zapped it best? They're about the same, enough to detect fish. So while researching this, um, I learned that not only platypuses, but dolphins too, um, 
can sense electrical fields with their bill. And they both do that to detect fish, um, which is pretty interesting. Humans don't detect, can't feel electrical fields unless there's like a lightning bolt out there. If you've ever been near a lightning bolt, you can really feel that zap in the air. Um, but other than that, we generally don't feel electrical fields. In just a moment, Yudair is going to go over the pixelated butterfly vision activity. But before we do that, I just want to talk a bit about the sense off. So the sense off is an activity that students can do in the classroom um, or at home online uh, doing research. So all they have to do is look up animal senses compared to humans online, and that will start coming up with results. Uh, and Google's little like top bar thing, I don't know what this is called, um, it already mentions one. Dogs have 300 million smell sensors versus 600 million in humans. What's great about this is that since when kids are doing these comparisons, they want to try to make sure they're comparing the same things, like smell sensors. Um, so we have 300 million versus 6 million. So upper grade students could perhaps do some math to figure out how many times stronger a dog's um, sense of smell is over human. This one already tells us here 50. Um, but if we keep going through the results, I'm sure we'll find more we can work with. Um, here's one. So this one is from um, University of Washington. Um, and then here uh, it has some interesting comparisons uh, around lots of different animals. So just list um, facts. Uh, like here's one, 100 million or 1 million photoreceptors per square millimeter. Oh, that's kind of a tough one to work with uh, for kids, uh, for buzzards. But let's look at sounds. So dolphins can hear up to 1,000 hertz or 100,000 hertz. Dogs can hear as high as 40,000 hertz. Cats can hear up to 60,000 hertz. Um, elephants can hear up to 20,000 hertz. So these it already gives different comparisons <laughs> between, um, between animals based on their hearing ability. Um, and there's lots of other facts here uh, about animals. And it's got a lot of on, on vision. Um, and this obviously isn't the only page students can use. Um, but the sense off is a great way for students who really just love learning about animals, um, to research animals and figure out good comparisons. Um, again, they want to make sure they're using the same, the same unit, whether it's uh, receptors um, or hertz or um, in one of them, I think I showed you had odorant genes, which is probably a little too scientific. I had to pull that from a research paper, so kids probably aren't looking there. Um, but it also, if they just find pages that say like, a cat sees 40 times better than a human and a dog sees 50 times better than a human. That's also good because we're using humans as the basis for that so they can see how cats and dogs relate to humans and hopefully draw a conclusion from there. Um, anyway, we're going to go over to Yadira now where she's going to talk about um, pixelated butterfly vision. Over to you, Yadira. Hi. I'm Yadira from Sunset Spark, and I'll be demonstrating butter the butterfly vision activity from our presentation, Making Sense of Sensors. So butterflies have a pretty cool vision power, but might not be in the way you think. Let's take a look. While butterflies can see more colors than most creatures, including humans, the resolution of these images are actually it's pretty limited. Um, butterflies have compound lenses that produce a blurry pixel effect. If you look closely at the image, you can see that these lenses are all over the, the eyeball. And that's what creates those broken up uh, pixel images when, they, when they're out in the wild. Let me show you a better example of how this might look. So here's a picture of what a butterfly might see on the left. Now, I took this picture in Sunset Park uh, about a month ago, and I took it on my iPhone. So on the right-hand side of the image, you'll see what like a human eyeball would see. Uh, it's pretty clear. The resolution is pretty good. Um, you can see a variation in color. Whereas on the left-hand side, um, 
while you could still see colors, uh, the resolution is, is pretty limited. Um, and I would say you could also see some depth there. But really, all butterflies are looking for are those bright, vibrant colors in flowers that will say, hey, I've got some juicy nectar here, because uh, that's really all they're after. So they don't necessarily need to have um, you know, great resolution like we do. So for today's activity, what we're going to do is use butterfly vision as our inspiration to create a cool piece of art. What you're going to need to do is you're going to want some graph paper or regular paper and, of course, some markers. If you prefer, you can totally use a drawing, a digital drawing app. Um, but this is a kind of a fun and relaxing activity to do as well. Okay. And lastly, you're going to need to pick an image for your students to recreate. So I'm going to go back to the original picture. Let me go here. Okay. So what I want you to do is just take a moment to really study the colors, um, the shapes, the forms, so that we can convert it into butterfly vision. Cool. All right. Good? Awesome. So I kind of got a head start. <laughs> I'm going to show you what I what I did and this is my of course my interpretation of that same image let me go ahead and show you that image again so here I used a nice blue to show the um, the um, what do you call that not the gate but the fence <laughs> And then in the back, I've got um, s the, the apartment buildings. But in the front here, what I was really trying to hone in on was making sure those pops of yellow um, were clear. So I made sure not to plot any of those dots um, too close to the yellow so that it could really look like you know, a daffodil. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how I did it on this side. Now, I'm not going for like a Monet or a Gauguin effect. I'm just loosely plotting these. There we go. And of course, as I showed you earlier with the image that, say, a butterfly may see, it it's all over the place. It's a pretty blurry um, image. So, here we go. Feeling look like that looks pretty good. I'm going to add some different colors as well to give it some depth. Great. And voila. A masterpiece. <laughs> so make sure you give yourself plenty of time for your students to uh, create their butterfly vision art. And of course, give, uh, give your class some time to also share. It's always great to compare the different perspectives that they might have and how colors and shapes stand out for them, too. All right? Good luck. Thanks. Welcome back. Now we're going to take a look at um, sensors. Um, so we're moving from senses to sensors. Sensors are kind of like senses, but they're human made and uh, they exist in the form of uh, technology. Um, so let's take a look. A good way to think about sensors or to get a, a, a point of reference for sensors is using smartphones because um, most kids have, have have used a phone before. Um, and so in a phone, you have accelerometers, which are 
used for detecting like the motion of this of it like if they play games on a phone it can tell like what direction it's moving um and they usually measure that in in uh xyz plane like x like mathematical like x y or z um same with magnetometer which it detects um direction like a like a digital compass um so it can detect whether you're facing a uh, magnetic north or not um there's also a gyroscope which should detect orientation whether it's um, facing up and down, side to side, <laughs> whichever direction it's facing, the gyroscope will tell you. And then there's also GPS in, in smartphones, which detect um, its position relative to Earth. Um, so where are you on Earth? GPS is a type of sensor that does that. But there's smarter smartphones out there now um, with more advanced sensors in them. There's light sensors that can detect brightness, so that's what makes your phone like dim. My phone, an iPad always like dim um, at the wrong time. I've always got to like bring the brightness back up. But the light sensor is the thing that says like, hey, you're in a really bright room. Um, you might want to turn this up, turn this brightness up. Or you're in a really dark room, you might want to turn this brightness down. Um, there's also moisture sensors, which can detect if the phone was wet. That's usually kept secret. You should keep that inside the phone to detect if you've dropped it in the toilet um, when you bring it in for repair. Um, there's barometers, which uh, can measure air pressure in, in some smartphones. Um, we have fingerprint touch, so that's a biometric sensor, uh, which looks at fingerprints, which is a very specific kind of sensor. Um, and then there's also depth cameras, which can do like facial maps. That's where it shoots like infrared light out, and it does like a map of your face um, for things like face ID. Or um, outside of cameras, there's also like 3D scanners that use depth depth maps, depth of cameras as well. Um, similar to humans, where our senses are combined, um, as I brought up earlier, how like taste and smell are combined, um, sight and hearing are combined. Like if you close your eyes and listen, you might hear things that um, when you open your eyes, it isn't what you expected. Um, so sight and hearing are combined. Um, smell and taste are combined. Um, technology combines sensors too. So it can take a lot of those things that we just saw, like the infrared, like an infrared camera, um, a dot projector, which is used for like face mapping, and it can take all that and create like a 3D model of your face for Face ID. Um, or it uh, can do the things that are required for like if you use like the Face app or like those those apps that like let you like put bunny ears on your head or whatever. Like those are using a combination of sensors to detect what your face looks like. It's using the camera, it's using the face map, it's using, um, it's using your accelerometer, um, typically to see how you're moving uh, the phone for frame of reference. So it's using a few things all at once in a, in a combination sense. Um, so technology often combines multiple sensors to get that, takes multiple inputs in and these combo sensors to create the output that you're seeing. Um, what's this sensing? Here's a sensor. What's it sensing? This is a flex sensor. So it senses bending. I've actually got one here. Um, let me bring that up. There we go. Um, so here's one right here. This is a little bit. Um, so I'm just going to plug it in so that we can see how it works. Um, all right, cool. So we're going to bend it. And as we bend it, it goes from zero to 99. Um, it doesn't take much to bend it to get it like that. Um, how this sensor works, let's zoom in. So this sensor, you can see these little pads on it. And it's actually got what they call like, it's like a conductive ink underneath the surface. And so when it bends, it's um, when it bends, it's moving. It's moving a little bit, and that that arch is actually creating a subtle distance in between these pads, which uh, since these pads are conductive, um, it reduces or increases the amount of electricity that's being conducted through them. You can see um, if we go back to that other picture. You can see that it's got um, a positive and negative side to it, and so the positive side has these little discrete pads, these little parts that go all the way to the end, 
and it loops back to the negative side. And so it's detecting um, the current that runs through this, and as you bend it, uh, where's that? As you bend it, it uh, that current increases and decreases. That signal increases and decreases. Um, let's take a look at another sensor. What's this one sensing? This one, um, you can see X, Y, Z on there. So this is a accelerometer. It senses acceleration. Um, typically, you can buy an accelerometer by itself, but they're typically packaged in what they call six DOF, six degrees of freedom, or nine DOF, nine degrees of freedom, where they combine acceleration, velocity, and orientation. Um, so it can tell how fast it's moving, how fast it's accelerating, and what position it's in. Um, so typically they're packaged as more than one, but you can, like if you're building something, you can get them slightly cheaper if you're just looking for one set of, of, uh, of, of data. What's this one sensing? I mean, it kind of says it on there, which isn't helpful. Um, but this is sensing air quality. So this actually sends, picks up chemicals and particulates in the air, and that the little box in the middle here, um, this little black box, it's got like a little hole in it, a little like cavern in it where like chemicals can fall into it, and it's so it's picking up those chemicals. Um, air quality sensors typically have some sort of cave in them that pulls the air in because it's it's got to like capture that air kind of to to measure measure the chemicals in that air. What's this one sensing? This one's pretty common in educational kits. You can see where it says echo here, which might give a hint. And the T and the R stands for transmitter and receiver. So these are, um, this is an ultrasonic sensor which senses distance. So the transmitter is sending out an ultrasonic signal and the receiver is receiving that, the echo of that ultrasonic single sig signal back. Um, and it uses that timing to detect distance. Um, these are common in like Lego robotics kits. Next up, we've got this mysterious one. What do you think this one is detecting? What is this sensing? This is a pretty new one, it's pretty advanced. This one is detecting radiation. This is a radiation sensor. It was developed shortly after the um, earthquake in Japan um, and the nuclear power plant meltdown um, so that citizens could go around and measure uh, radioactivity on their own. Um, so this can hook up to a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino um, and it helps people measure uh, radiation like a Geiger counter. Take a look at one more sensor. We've got a sensor over here um, that is a force sensor. And so if you plug this in, it will detect force when you push down. It detects how much you're pushing it in. It's a force sensor. But let's zoom in on that pad a little bit. Um, because it's got an interesting pattern on it. Um, so this, this pad, you can see like this zigzag pattern here. Um, that it's got, again, a positive side and a negative side, and they don't quite touch. If you look, they never touch. The thing that's making them touch is, again, it's detecting the, um, the current that runs through it the, um, when you touch it. And so when we touch it with something, it is, it's creating a circuit there with that touch. And so the more we touch it, the more circuit, the, the closer those um, little conductive pieces underneath are getting pushed together, and that is what's making the signal go up. Let's take a look as I zoom out. Um, so unlike a phone that really requires human skin to touch it, this is just anything. I'm just gonna use the, the rubber tip of this pencil here. Um, anything can trigger, because all it's doing is pushing those little pads together, which is creating um, more, pushing them together, which allows more current to run through it. And so those little zigzag patterns are getting squished together. Um, and even though they're only getting squished together just a tiny bit, that's making a difference in the amount of electricity that runs through it. And so it's able to sense that. Anyway. 
Up next, we've got um, a design activity where we're going to be designing sensors, um, where we're going to be looking at, uh, at environments and different things that might be in that environment. Yadira is going to walk us through that. Hi, Yadira again uh, with Sunset Spark. Um, and this next activity is designing a sensor using a sensory chart. So for this, our goal is to guide students through a charting process to design a unique sensor given uh, space and problem. Um, we turn to nature's amazing creatures for a little inspiration with that. So here are some key takeaways for this particular activity. So before you begin, you're going to have a will sensory chart to refer back to to help describe the place. Um, of course, then we'll need to identify a problem within that space. Um, and that will help us kind of isolate certain senses that are important to that problem. Um, and those particular areas will then kind of help us hone in what kind of creatures can help us resolve the problem. So let's start off by reviewing the sensory chart. Okay. So here we're, we're going to refer to the five core senses. So as I mentioned, we need to be able to pick a space um, to start off with. And in that space, we want to walk you through these steps of how would, what would you see, all right? So you can chart out as many. Um, specifics as you want. What would we taste? Again here you really want to activate imagination as well. What would we smell? What would we hear? And what uh, would we feel? Okay. All right. And then that will help guide us to what kind of animals would be good for this study. Okay. So for the sake of being fun and creative, we're going to select a school cafeteria for our space. So we're going to go through this chart and I'll share with you what some of the teachers um, added as we were filling this out together. So for the first column, what would we see? We have trays of food, long lines, kids running around, dirty lunch tables, I mean, your experience might be different, but again, this is just as a simple walkthrough. All right, so what would we taste? All right, so cafeteria food, some tasty, maybe some not so tasty. Uh, what would we smell? So this smells kind of greasy, tater tots, garbage maybe, wet mop. <laughs> Let me do this. What would we hear? People talking loud, clanging, kids being kids. And what would we feel? Perhaps sticky floors as we walk across the cafeteria floor, uh, or slimy floors, slippery floors, uh, maybe ketchup on the table, <coughs> salt or the graininess grain of a uh, table. <laughs> What rag? Ooh. All right. So this should kind of help us look at, look for any patterns. Maybe there's a particular sense that stands out um, that would help us maybe uh, select a, a creature with those kind of superpowers. Okay. So then once you have that charted out, we're going to start thinking about how to design a sensor based off of those core elements. So here's some of the, um, yeah, so here's the next layer of that. So identify problems within that space. So overall, just doesn't smell good. <laughs> what senses are important to this problem? Well, smell, odor receptors, and taste. What kind of creature senses can solve your problem? So strong smell, so maybe a snake or a catfish could help. So describing our new sensor. All right. So what might be good is, well, 
we probably want to find creatures that um, are able to, or sorry, we probably want to select or design a sensor that could pick up those receptors, those odor receptors that um, m perhaps contain certain chemicals that smell good, right? Like chemicals or ingredients such as in um, pizza or chocolate chip cookies. Um, and then maybe we want to design another sensor that could pick up bad smells, like the smells of a wet mop or grease. Um, so we may want to tap a catfish or snake in this case. So now that we have kind of a general idea of what creatures might be helpful, the next step would be to then design a, a sensor to address that problem within the space. So it can get as creative and as imaginative as your kids want it to be. Um, but what's nice about this particular activity is there's a lot of charting in that process and a lot of more documentation. Um, so it's not so much arts and crafts in this particular version of it, um, but it's a little bit more methodical. So I hope you enjoy the activity. Thanks. Thanks for joining us for this workshop. Uh, we hope you found it informative. Um, if you'd like to contact us, you can contact us at hello at sunsetspark.org or you can uh, reach us on social media at, at sunsetsparknyc on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, you can give us a follow. Uh, but please email us if you have any questions or need any help um, or anything else. Thank you. Bye.